No, it's recording. Okay, bye bye for me. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you, Karita. Yes, good morning for everybody. I'm going to start a new week here. Uh, I am Harry Strandmaki, and uh, I'm an author. And uh, I have written several plays. I started as a play writer. Uh, I studied uh, theater directing in the theater academy in Finland and also in Germany and England. And uh, I have been uh, directing about 70, 70 uh, plays, many of them in Finland, but uh, some of them in uh, Germany and Sweden. And lately, uh, I have been uh, directing in New York City. And I was starting a new career in the New York City. I have uh, made there two plays and directing them. But then this pandemic started, and uh, now it's uh, just awaiting a better chance to start again there. Uh, and uh, I have also written several, several books and titles for the children and young adults and for the adults about uh, 80 books, I guess, novels. And uh, I have also made something with uh, uh, play companies, game companies, I mean. I was working in Robio with uh, the amazing Alex. And I also have written several books for them too. When there was these uh, times in the Robio that they wanted uh, spread their doing with the children books also and uh, i was uh, structuring games there also i'm uh, 53 years old i live in finland in Ulojärvi, which is a town nearby tampere and uh, i'm living in this old over 100 years old uh, farmhouse here Sometimes I'm also teaching creative writing in several places in Finland and also abroad. Last time I was uh, on abroad, I was uh, teaching creative writing and uh, actor skills uh, in Columbia University in New York City. Today's uh, topic is. Uh, archetypes and stereotypes and uh, making a characterization and if you are thinking of drama it can be animation it can be a movie it can be a children book or whatever fictional story we have uh, we really need to have a strong characters because the personality of the character is uh, making this whole drama. If the character is weak and it's very average like and boring, it's the same thing with the plot. I mean, plot. Uh, the action in the plot will be weak and boring because the person is weak and boring. And uh, there are so many thousands of years of storytelling in our cultures. So we have uh, many kinds of character types, and some of them are kind of archetypes that are uh, remaking their entrees all the time. And uh, I was first thinking that we could uh, see some of these very common uh, archetypes that we use many, many times all the time, uh, for example, in the movies or in the animations or games and some of them are of course familiar for you and they are so familiar because we start as the children with the fairy tales that our parents or some adults are telling for us or reading for us so we kind of get used to of these uh, fairy tale characters and some of them of course are so so old that uh, they will come in uh, having these archetypes uh, a style and also there are mythic stories and uh, also they can be very stereotypes 
So we kind of have to upgrade all the time these characters and we have uh, much of freedom of doing this. But um, there's always uh, lurking these kind of cliches that are uh, kind of dangerous for the stories that we are making. Of course, this character is kind of uh, so many times seen that there is nothing new. So we always kind of trying to find some minor, it don't have to be a kind of uh, the world changing thing, because it's uh, very unusual that you can find these kind of character. Sometimes, of course, there will be, but then uh, the other writers will rip off them these when you find something new. And of course, in sometimes they are not so long living new characters, but in the first year, but mostly all the new characters, they have a minor details that will take them in a new level. So let's see some uh, common characters. I have here, here 12 characters and uh, Karita will share these uh, files for you. Because, uh, sorry to say, but I don't know how to share in this with uh, my iPhone. And uh, there is some kind of problems with my laptop that uh, it's not good to use in Zoom link. So that's why there are problems. But sorry about that. Okay. So let's start with these archetypes and then we will go to the stereotypes. And uh, we will see one case of uh, Silence of the Lambs movie, I guess that uh, maybe everybody is familiar with this uh, serial killer story. And uh, then we will have uh, some little exercise with the characterizations. But yeah, let's start for the uh, common characters. For the first, there is the warrior. It can be a man, it can be a woman, but it's the person with a plan. Hercules is one of the common and well-known the warrior type in archetypes. For example, Hercules is armed with a particular set of skills and the sheer force of their will. And of course, if he's the hero, and most of the cases, he is the hero. This hero will conquer the enemy and carry the day, as we can say. Person is interesting when there are strengths and there are weaknesses and there are desires. And uh, Hebrews is that's why so familiar and uh, so famous and so easy to use because he's the kind of person that have courage, strength, and the strength is uh, boldly physical and mental. And he's kind of person that have a ability to use his courage and strengths. But I think that mostly for me, Hercules is an interesting cause uh, He's got these uh, great weaknesses. One is ego. Ego is very interesting thing for the person. Sometimes the ego is hidden underneath his uh, or her knowing. But uh, in the story, he or she will grow in that way that uh, he or she will understand or use for the good or for the bad, his or her ego. Anyway, Hercules have a big ego and uh, his second very bad weakness is uh, overconfidence. He's always thinking that, yeah, I can do anything I want and I'm so strength and I have a physical and mental uh, abilities to do things and then everything will collapse. And that's why as a children or young adults or adult people love Hercules because we can 
kind of very easily understand these kind of things. And when we are watching drama as a spectator, as an audience in theater or movie theater or with friends in the sofa and watching something from Netflix, for example. And when we can see this kind of Hercules and there are humor and there are sad things about him, uh, we can understand and empathize uh, his actions. The warrior, or in this case, Hercules, desire is to save the day and prove their worth. So there is this ego thing that, yeah, I'm the one who can save this big planet or city or village or whatever he is saving, trying to save. And they can prove when they succeed in their mission that, yeah, I saved today. And if you are thinking that uh, the way how Hercules is doing things, sometimes succeeding and sometimes not, uh, we kind of see that uh, he's an ordinary people with his uh, abilities and superpowers. And that's the same thing with uh, many of uh, heroes, Batman, Spider-Man, Spider-Man have many abilities, physical or mental strengths, but uh, for example, in comics and movies and games, he succeeds in one area of his life and on the other areas, he's losing things. And I think this is the one thing that uh, Spider-Man is so popular for people that are reading or watching his adventures in New York City or wherever he's going, but basically in Manhattan area in New York City. But the examples of the warrior is uh, Odysseus from the Lord of the Rings, of course, Aragorn, very much like uh, Hercules. He's got ego, he's trying to save the day and he's proving his uh, uh, abilities and he will become a king. Also, if you think mostly of the Tom Cruise's characters that uh, he's choosing to act, not maybe in the first movies that he was acting, but uh, when he got succeeded very young, uh, all his uh, action movies, are based off this kind of warrior. It can be a Jack Reacher or it can be in Mission Impossible, Ethan Hawke, anyway, the same thing all the time. And uh, his heroes are having weaknesses and strengths. And uh, he's acting very much like Hercules. Maybe not a superpower, but uh, his ability is to be a kind of superhero is there in a natural way. As in this movie, uh, action like is possible. Okay, the second one is uh, the child. And uh, usually there is innocence, which is lust. And uh, the child or children in the story is growing up. It can be made for the children or it can be made for the adult and there are children actors uh, acting these uh, characters. And uh, this archetype usually follows as a young or very naive character who sees the world through rose tinted glasses, as we say, until he or she realizes that what is really happening in the world and what is really happening inside of my person. And uh, there's this kind of uh, uh, innocence lost there. And sometimes, like in the Wizard of Oz, when there is Dorothy, which is the main character, the child, uh, he will learn or she will learn a lesson or two about the real world around them, as in the Oz, as in, also in the Kansans. 
and they are kind of mirror-like uh, worlds, and it's also kind of inside of them. Because the cancer is very much like us, and us is very much like cancer, and also they are very different from each others. This child, as a character, as an archetype, uh, his strengths are optimism, as most of the child have, enthusiasm, they were eager to watch things and maybe flying to the adventures or dreaming about adventures and seeing things that uh, grown-ups doesn't see anymore or they don't want to see it. And also, maybe the most interesting part of the child character is imagination. I mean, that's the limitless imaginations that they have. Weaknesses are naivety, physical powerlessness. Their desire is to be happy or be happier. And it's kind of things that is very sad and it always make for the audience strong emotions. Because we can understand if we are children watching children cartoons and we can see that the, the child character as an archetype is uh, kind of sad most of the time and he or she is trying to be happy or even happier. We really can understand and relate of that. For the third one, is the orphan. This is the one which is uh, very famous in Harry Potter. And it's kind of very usual in the children's stories because it's easy for the writer or author uh, to use the orphan as an excuse for the things that are said for the, for example, for the Harry Potter. And uh, orphans got uh, most to gain from good fortune. They really have to do all kinds of things to uh, gain fortune, good fortune for them. And uh, they're searching for a kind of new family, we can see. Because when they are child or children, they really need their new family and new parents. And they have many strengths. And one is like Harry Potter, survival instinct. The whole Harry Potter hero character is depending on this instinct in the very first steps of his life. And he's surviving this horrible attack is happening for him in the first place in the story. Also, the orphans are probably very good in empathy. They have seen so many sad things happening for them and they can see good things happening for others. So they are kind of interesting to use their empathy to understand people and people are maybe interesting to see and be a friend of these kind of characters like Harry Potter is. And that's why it's so easy for him to make uh, friends with uh, uh, his best, best uh, friends, Ronda and Hermione. Harry Potter's or orphan's weaknesses are always the same. Lack of confidence, which is very understandable, isn't it? Sometimes, as Harry Potter, their willingness to please others, because they have to use pleasing things to get a little bit of share of somebody's happiness, maybe. I have sometimes visited orphanages as a young teacher, I had some 
students that were living in orphanage. And the first time when I was there, I was 19 years old. And uh, I was kind of surprised how silent orphanage was. I mean that, uh, of course, there was shouting and there were speaking and screaming, but uh, there was something lacking. And in that moment of my life, I have been so familiar with the uh, children, my family's uh, and relatives, uh, uh, little children, which were crying all the time. Uh, I don't mean that 24 uh, seven, but something happens, the crying is the kind of reaction, which is very normal for the children. I didn't hear any kind of crying. And then I got the point. Because there is no point for crying in the orphanage. And that was kind of opening thing for myself and kind of sorry. And also if things, uh, if things uh, Harry Potter's life in the first pages in Harry Potter uh, novel or in the first movie, we can see that uh, there's no place for tears. Desires to trip and connect with others. And that's the one thing which is happening in this uh, movie or novel series for the Harry Potter. But there are more examples also. Charles Dickens famous Oliver Twist or in the hands back of Notre Dame, Victor Hugo's famous novel and all kind of uh, adaptations for the movies about that also in animation movies, Quasimodo. He's also a very famous orphan. For the fourth, there is the creator. And uh, for this kind of character, nothing is more important than the need to make something, to create something. And in many stories, a creator will be an artist of some sort of uh, uh, maybe science guy, science person, science dict. And they are willing to sacrifice their own well being and also all his or her uh, relationships in the pursuit of this greater goal to succeed in creating something. And of course, this is kind of a one track mind, or we can say single minded vision. And that's why in the stories like this, this kind of archetype person as the creator often pay the greatest personal price. And that's one thing which is also very emotional for the audience to witness the, the creator's fall of this greatest personal price that they will pay. Strengths are creativity, of course, kind of furious drive, the ability to execute their vision. Nothing will stop them for the final act in these kind of stories. Weaknesses are personal sacrifice, perfectionism, kind of zero tolerance. And uh, they're demanding very much of themselves and also for the other characters around them. And that's why they are very egoistic. Egotism is one of their weaknesses. And sometimes in the course of the story, it can be a war story, Sometimes this kind of egoism is good for the cause in these hard situations, but maybe in the long run, it's bad. Desires. The creator desires most of the time to create something of value. And this kind of value that uh, you can say to cement their legacy. So there is this big ego sometimes, most of the times when we are thinking of these kind of persons. If you think of animations, I will think Remy from the Ratatouille, uh, 
animations. Hamilton moving, there is this Alexander Hamilton, which is the uh, creator of the story. Of course, Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll from Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Hyde. Willy Wonka also in Roald Dahl's story, which is made many adaptations, is kind of uh, creator. Then there is a fifth character, which is the caregiver. And if you are thinking the Lord of the Rings saga, trilogy, novels, there is Samwise Gamgee, which is the caregiver. Selflessness is the defining attribute of this character type. They might be a mother or father, wife, husband or best friend, as Sam Weiss is. Whoever they are, they will do anything, all the time, anything, just to protect their child, their ward, their lover, or best butt. And they will never give up. And they can also sacrifice themselves in this action. And it's quite rare to the caregiver archetype character that they will take, as we can say, uh, the center of the states. You know, he or she is some kind of in the beings of the states, maybe uh, acting in the shadows, and they don't like to be in the center, in the focus, in the spotlights. And it's okay for them. And if you think how Peter Jackson is uh, directing Samwise's actor in The Lord of the Rings, you can see that uh, most of the time Samwise is uh, using kind of acting tool for the selflessness. And that's why he's so lovable. His strength, of course, is selflessness and generosity. Weaknesses are also selflessness because they are so open to exploitation and they will all the time will be tired of this uh, hard job that they are having in their function, in their missions. But their deepest desire is to protect and help others. And that's why he's kind of, uh, or see, he's kind of uh, archetype that is very useless, uh, useful, I mean, not useless <laughs> in the stories, because we can use uh, Samwise all the time when the Frodo is kind of losing his ability to carry this uh, hard rock, like you can say with the ring that he's carrying. In the movie, we need to talk about Kevin, which is a very great story, adaptation from a great novel, dealing about school massacre. But it's going in the mother's mind, which is Eva, and her son have made terrible thing. And she's trying to understand the world, herself, her boy, all these lost classmates, schoolmates, and it's very hard progression. But she is a, truly a turkey, ca the caregiver, and uh, of course, she's, she's an archetype, but uh, as a person, there are some new aspects on her. Of course, Mary Poppins, in the Mary Poppins story, is the one of the kind. So for the sixth, the mentor. 
of course, we can think of uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, which is much like a uh, wizard, but happening, of course, in this uh, space opera uh, area, which is very much the same as in the Lord of the uh, Ring uh, is Gandalf, this wizard in the Lord of the Rings. And uh, also Mr. Miyagi in the Karate Kid trilogy. Sometimes mentor is a parent. Other times it might be a wizard or suburban karate teacher as in the Karate Kid. Whatever form they take, they are there to guide our hero through the unknown. And uh, if you're thinking your life, you can see that you also have all kinds of archetypes uh, in your life, people who have been mentor for yourself. And uh, they are very important, important persons for our growing and understanding our identity. And they are helping. Maybe not in the easiest way, but they are helping. Whatever form your mentors or stories mentor take, they are there to guide. And the original purpose of this archetype was probably to convince younger generations of people to listen to their older, uh, frailer tribe mates, I guess. Because uh, in the old stories, there are always these tribe mates and uh, they are very, very old. And these young people are not so eager to listen to their mumbling about something. It's the same in the Asian stories, uh, fairy tales, also in the mythical stories, as in Africa or uh, South America. Mentors' things are wisdom as in Gandalf, the gray or experience. Gandalf is very old. Their weaknesses are inability to act. Something happens for them. As an Obi-Wan Kenobi, we can see that uh, he's facing his death in the Star Wars uh, series uh, number four. A new hope, where he kind of dies. Venus is always going with them with the caution. The desire is to help the hero push past their boundaries and make sense of the world. Obi Wan Kenobi know very much about the universe and Sith Lords and all these things that are happening in Star Wars uh, saga. Same thing with the Gandalf. And they don't share their wisdom and knowledge very easily, kind of tripping them part and part. Okay, next one is seventh. The Joker. Of course, the Joker in Batman is very much the Joker, but uh, we can also sing the thing uh, and see Disney's um, Lion King. And there's Timon and Pumpa, which are also jokers. And uh, in Disney's earliest movies, as well, Disney was directing them. We can always see these kind of jokers around the uh, hero or the villain. Joker can be the fool, the clown, the jester. He or she can be the hedonist of the story. This archetype has many faces. But if you see any character saying something like, relax, dude, or chin out, then they are the, probably the choker in the back. In meat, in mythical words, chokers often act as a cautionary tale, warning people not to waste too much time in pursuit of pleasure. And there are very old stories in antics and medieval 
1880s that we had in Western culture in Europe. In modern culture, they are often the comic relief, but uh, they were kind of warners in the old times. And of course you can use as you want them. Joker strengths are likability. It's kind of interesting that uh, Batman is uh, this very dark, dark hero, dark knight in this dark or noir story likes. Of course, there are these uh, other Batmans. But if you're th thinking these uh, kind of gloomy Batman stories, the Joker is much more likability having a character than Batman, who is so traumatized, so deep in his traumas. And he can be kind of a very sharp mind detective, but he's kind of crazy. Of course, he's heard of his wounds in the childhood, losing his parents in front of his eyes. And Batman doesn't have any kind of choiceness. The Joker had. Of course, the Joker has mental problems, but so is also Batman. So they're kind of good duo, bad and evil, in a way that sometimes you can see that there is good things almost pumping up in the Joker. And we can see this evil side of the Batman. Of course, we can see this good size too. They don't take care. This is the weakness. They don't care the Jokers if they die. Maybe they are searching to death. But also they're trying to find a way to have a good and happy times. So it's kind of uh, contradictions there with the weaknesses and desires. One desire is to live for today, just for a moment. Joker doesn't say anything about his past. And uh, of course we have some stories what probably could happen for him, but we are not sure. And they are trying to be happy. And they are clowns. They hide their tears for the laugh. In the Winnie the Pooh, as in book and also in Disney's uh, movie and uh, animation series, this tiger, which is the same so-called kind of thing. So eight, the magician. The aspiring masters of the universe. They are driven by their nature. Magicians seek enlightenment, but unlike the mentors, they also want to impose their will on the world around them. Mentors doesn't want impose their, impose their will, but the magician will, and uh, of course, magicians can easily impress others. Even if they are not wizards, their abilities are beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. And there's mysteries about them. They will have or will not have a kind of supernatural powers or real magic, or they are just uh, fooling us. And sometimes we don't know. And I think that one of the, for me, for the most interesting magician is Sherlock Holmes. This detective that are so familiar and so famous for generations. Just think how many TV shows have made them. All these Sherlock Holmes is uh, magician archetypes. Strengths are in knowledge and power. Their truly weakness is hubris. Their big ego. 
their desire is to create order from chaos and bend the world to their will. They have a vision. And they will bend the world in their own visions. In Marvel's comic sagas, Doctor Strange, it's one of the magicians, of course, in King Arthur's and his uh, knights, mythologies and stories. There is this magician Merlin. In F. Scott Fitzgerald's great novel, The Great Gatsby, J. Gatsby is a magician. For the ninth, there is the ruler, which is King Arthur. Any society in the stories probably needs a leader. But how does that leader cope with absolute power? Did King Arthur have in his magical or historical stories? Do they rule with kindness and compassion or with an iron fist? And the Game of Thrones is a good example about this kind of archetypes. Strength of the ruler is leadership, charisma, power. Weaknesses is inability to delegate. They just want to do anything for themselves. They don't delegate for anything for anybody. They are suspicious and they can be very neurotic minds. The desire is to control big control for everything. And also to hold on to power all the time. They hate the idea that uh, they will lose their kingdom or their throne. Examples is uh, very good in William Shakespeare's Macbeth. In the movie, The Devil Wears Prada, which is funny, there is this character Miranda Presley. Sees her through the ruler and uh, kind of a not cliche way of the ruler in this time when uh, it was in the novel and in the movie, which is the adaptation. And if you think The Simpsons, the longest animation series ever run, still running, Mr. Burns. He is the ruler. Tenth is the rebel. Rebel is mad as hell. That is the true nature of the rebel's archetype. Mad as hell. In the face of an unjust society, they are the ones with the will to overthrow the status quo. A rebel might be a charismatic leader, but they also might work in secret. They can be a freedom fighter, or rock musician, or the girl in the chemistry class with the purple highlights in her hair. We can see these kind of uh, archetypes in Ghostbusters movie series. Also in the Hunger Games, also adaptation from a best-selling uh, young adults uh, science fiction book, Katniss Everdeen. Her name is, for the people who know her, is symbolizing the archetype of the rebel. In the 80s, Paris Bureau's Day Off which was a big young adult uh, movie, very successful, very pure. Then in the element, the lover. First in my mind is Romeo and Juliet. They are lovers. This archetype will do anything for love, anything. They are passionately interesting about love. 
whoever they are. They have love in their lives and it makes them more driven and devoted than you can imagine. So the driving force for the lovers is the energy of love. The downside of this passion is that they are often willing to sacrifice everything for the ones they love, which can be a one-way ticket to the tragedy, which is the case in the Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet, as lovers, they don't have any kind of problems uh, with each other, but they have uh, very much troubles with their society. Lovers' things are devotion, passion, and weaknesses, this uh, kind of crazy willingness to sacrifice identity. identity. I mean that the, they're losing their identity because uh, when the lovers have each other's, they kind of made a one person there and they are trying to be as a one in this case when they are falling in love so they are sacrificing their identity life and liberty and that's why they are so interesting persons as an archetype there are much of things to create with these uh, characters, minds. Their desire is being in a relationship. What kind of relationship they are? They can be erotic, they can be romance, they can be any kind of passionate uh, relationship. Okay, William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Also from the Twilight Saga, Edward is the one which is doing the same thing. Is it a tragedy or is it just comedy? You can say it. And for the last, 12th, the seduc dress. Persons who are seducting us like sirens in Odyssey. I will give you whatever you want. That's a refrain of the seductress, a character that comes in all shapes, all sizes, all genders. They might offer power, offer sex, love, money, or influence, but the, these things always come with string attached. If a seductress is involved, the moral of the tale is almost always don't believe anything that's too good to be true. And they are great uh, force for the writers, the seductress. Don't believe anything that's too good to be true. Their strengths are charisma. Also, their big strength is lack of morals. They don't have any kind of moral standards and moral problems. Their weaknesses are a kind of dangerous thing for the people, character, who believe them. Their weaknesses is emptiness of their promises. They can be a narcissistic persons. They can be quite plotty and witty in their mind, and they have their own plots in their minds, and there is always a price. Because they are offering all kinds of things. But all these things that they are offering, they're just empty, empty promises. Their desire is to control, control everything. Good examples. In old age literature, Mephistopheles in Faust, all these empty promises. Delay from Samson and Delay. And also, in quite many antique stories, female characters are these kind of uh, sirens and seductresses. For example, in this the Odyssey. 
So we have here 12 common character archetypes. And uh, I hope that uh, you could use them in many ways as a tool when you are making a fictional character. First of, first of all, if you watch all around your own world, your own life, your history, your friend's history, your family's history, and you can see how people are acting and reacting. What kind of focuses they have. It's kind of a surprise. Anyway, it was for me when I was thinking these kind of archetypes first times in my life, that there are so many archetype people in my life and uh, my life was depending on them. And that was kind of uh, tragedy and comedy to find out, for example, for these friends and relatives around me in my childhood, which was the orphan or which was the creator and so on and so on. And of course, when you are reading books and watching movies and playing games, you can see these kind of archetypes. And they are not cliches. It's not just a kind of a thing that the, if there's a warrior in the story, it's bad. It's bad when it's doing in the, in the way that the, there are too many stereotypes there. So there is a thing that the, we can say cliche. And evading cliches Cliches uh, and stereotypes is uh, one which is uh, very important for the creator who will create characters. But I think that we could have a little pause here, maybe a tea pause. Is five minutes okay? If it's okay. Yep. Sunny yes. Kate said that. And I guess the other ones is maybe in the same mood. So five. Uh, five minutes and then we will go with the evading crisis, tropes and stereotypes. Yes, great. Let's see in five minutes.
No niin. Nyt alkaa sulle viisi minuuttia. Ah, oh, sorry. And now it seems that five minutes is done. So we can continue with the crises and stereotypes. First of all, avoiding, avoiding uh, crises, overused tropes and uh, exhausted stereotypes. Sorry to say, but it can be difficult, but it's possible to create a fresh story and fresh characters by simple simply thinking out of the box. I mean that, uh, as I said, when we were children, as a child, we get these all new stories and they were new for us. And uh, sometimes some children are making their own stories. They have influences from these ones that they have heard and listened and maybe read. And they were original because they are simply thinking out of the box. But sometimes you can see in many stories, and it's very natural way, human way, that uh, they're kind of uh, repeating the same thing over and over again. So we need a aspect of you thinking out of the box. And this is our own personal identity, how we can see and feel and uh, what we think about life, all these great things that uh, make our person for own. So first it is uh, to understand these overused cliches, tropes and stereotypes is identify them. And if you think cliches, Crises are phrases or expressions that have been used well past the sell by date. And in fiction, crisis refers to characters or story elements that the reader or audience can spot and evade a mile away. I mean that we can see this uh, same thing repeating all the time, which I had uh, problems with the Twilight stories. For example, fictional single parent characters tend to live with their mom if the characters are male and the dad if the characters are female. I repeat it. In fiction, single parent characters tend to live with their mom if the characters are male and dad if the characters are female. And this is Bella Swan in The Twilight, who is living with her dad when she met Edward. This is so many times used. One way of evading a cliche is to experiment with modern examples of families. And there's a new uh, perspective thing to watch, a new way of looking things. For example, mixed race families. There are quite many opportunities in this. Science fiction, fantasy, paranormal and uh, magic theme stories offer writers far more opportunities to create different families. And I think that the, the one thing why this kind of uh, genres, science fiction, fantasy, paranormal, horror, magic, whatever stories there are, which are not uh, realistic stories, they are so many writers writing them because they have opportunities to create something different. It's maybe not so that they are so eager about these genres, but they have opportunities in dramaturgy, the way to make a drama in their stories. I think that uh, it really doesn't matter if the father in the story is a vampire or the mother of werewolf. The key to making it work is to write uh, in realistic problems that people face in the everyday world. To write in 
realistic problems that people face in the everyday world. So I think that these uh, vampires and uh, spaceships and all kinds of old uh, creatures in space, it's not the first thing. It's the first thing that uh, the heroes and all these characters which are made into space, uh, they face realistic problems in their own world. And it's kind of the same that we have in our world. And this is why I think that uh, the Lord of the Rings are so popular, or Game of Thrones or Star Wars saga or whatever. So the problem of two very different uh, characters getting together and trying to make it work in an original world. I mean that uh, when different characters is getting together and they are trying to make it work in an original world, we can see the same analogy in our uh, life and world too. So we have overused tropes. Which is what is trope? Trope are storylines or themes within the story that make story very predictable. I mean that we can see that okay, this is the story. One of the common tropes are the damsel in distress. It's so much used. Of course, if somebody finds something new in the damsel in distress, yeah, great. But many times it's always the same. One way of evading tropes is to draw a realistic character in worst case scenarios. I always try to think in every story, which is the worst case scenario in this story like world. The hero in the story, for example, isn't, isn't immune to emotions or physical pain. That's one good thing to understand. And then we can. Uh, kind of uh, evade tropes when we can see that our hero is uh, not immune to emotions or physical pain. Because they don't, when they don't have any kind of pains, it's kind of hard to relate them, I think. Anyway, emotions or physical pain allow him to experience anger, rage, lust and of course pain so if there is violent and why not let bullets injure him or her and leave scars on her or his handsome face and it will add to his or her uniqueness and uh, when i'm thinking drama i always think that there is an actor it can be animated actor. But anyway, after which is acting with her or his body for us. And of course, it's play, it's game, it's acting. It's not true, but uh, actors are very good to make for a view of uh, pain. But she's only acting. Fiction is a form of entertainment. It can be art, it can be all kinds of popular things, but fiction is, a for, fiction is a form of entertainment. And fiction, I think that leave for the reader, for the watcher, a gasping thing when they are turning page and seeing another scene. And we are trying to understand the story and mostly of them, the characters. So I think that the main thing to evade stereotypes and tropes are understanding very well our characters. So that's why they take time uh, to create uh, memorable characters in story. If you think stereotypes, the name says says it all, stereotypes are used to categorize certain groups of people in some kind of 
eight or ten rays. It, they can be fresh in the 70s, but they are now stereotypes. So things are changing, of course. And we have to understand that uh, it's fiction. So in the real life, sometimes, and it kind of laughs me, uh, people are so stereotyped. For example, how they are working and acting in a working place. And they have these roles. Of course, we have all kinds of roles. But sometimes the roles that people are using in the working places are so stereotyped, but they don't understand it. And these are the things that make also popular examples of stereotypes. For example, a drunken Irish man. So what's new about that? Meditating Buddhists chosen characters with secret powers and heroes falling in love with a rude bossy heroine at first sight. Yeah, they are stereotypes. But what kind of characters are living these kind of things? Then we can evade these stereotypes. So it's not the acting, it's just the how they act and how they act is telling something about their inner person forces weaknesses driving forces so i think that spectators prefer likable characters they can relate to and root for spectators prefer likable characters they can relate to and root for and that's the one ability for the writer to understand these stereotypes in life and make it some kind of in a new way, in a new look or perspective in fiction. So characters should have full backgrounds that include flaws backgrounds that include secrets, certain insecurities, as well as strengths. As I was saying in these archetypes. Some ways, such as, for example, paranormal and fantasy, allows writers to use their imaginations to the fullest, and sometimes create marvelous new creatures. That's a, one good thing with this sun race. Every sun race have their good and bad things for the writer. But in the paranormal fantasy, you can, or science fiction or horror or whatever, uh, you can make new creatures that readers or spectators have never heard. And they will have extraordinary problems. So that's one of the cool things about these genres. Contemporary fiction also allows writers to introduce characters who push the boundaries. For example, it's very different now to make a crime stories with all kinds of uh, persons and uh, their ages or races or religions, when they solve crimes. It was very different in 60s or 70s or 80s. So it's also changing. And I think that the, always the interesting thing with the character is to push the boundaries. For example, in their careers, as a policeman, with a degree in chemistry who uses his knowledge to solve his crimes. So they don't have to be a kind of a 
Sherlock Holmes. They could be quite average people who have studied different things that they can use solving the crimes. And they have their personal problems, of course, inside of them, inside of their personal and hidden places in their unconscious mind. One thing is uh, always good to understand and build a better backstory for the characters. Of course, as in real life, when we are starting to know somebody, maybe a friend, maybe a lover, and you will understand that uh, this person have past and all kinds of things have happened for him or her. So when I start making characters, I mostly take time in my imagination to understand the things they have done. And the things that they will be evolved, twenty ten or not. So they have done things they are maybe ashamed of. Kissed or fucked someone they shouldn't have, stolen something, hurt animals. Maybe some may have even murdered someone. And these kind of things are in the past. Maybe they are open or maybe they are in secret. So as a writer, I encourage to view backgrounds that shape characters. Because backgrounds, all things, all the time, uh, shape characters' identity. The way how she or he understands themselves. Backstories may also provide characters with defining moments that determines their desires. With a background, we can understand what kind of uh, uh, traumatized things there are in their past and why they have these kind of desires. Why they are so scared about these kind of things. Why they maybe deny love. There is no love, no love for me. Okay. What is the backstory of this idea? And as better we know the character as a background, as easier is it to make, uh, to react and act in the present time. And it's the same time, the same thing in the real life too. When you are understanding your lover or friend or relative, maybe your father who have died, and you find something new evidence about his past, which is secret for you. And then you will understand more. And that sets the pace for the story. So, build a better back stories. Combine cliches. I mean that the, it's probably not easy uh, to await all the cliches that are in the world and in all kinds of stories. But you can always combine them. That could be kind of golden rule. For example, the author, Susan Collins, uh, revealed that she developed the idea for this best-selling Hunger Games series while channel hopping and came across people competing for prize money on one show and people fighting a real war on another channel. So he was, she was combining two kind of uh, cliche games. I also was thinking Battle Royale, which is uh, adaptation of a battle royale novel in Japan, when these young students, one class is uh, 
forced to uh, battle each others and just one can survive in this crazy crazy punishment which is kind of science fiction this story about the dysfunctional class anyway the susan collins result is uh, famous in the fight to the death plot and when they are so young these people it's different than its adults but uh, combining cliches ensure that the story does not follow a predictable conclusions and uh, that's the one thing why this series have been a best-selling stories of course so many have made making rip-offs about that so it's not so original anymore Here are some basic story plots that uh, are stereotyped. From zero to hero, and a bit uh, no any kind of problems with that. No obstacles, just easily go to zero to hero. Same thing with racks to riches. It's, it's kind of, you know, Cinderella story, these rags to riches. The chosen one who must defeat a monster or bad guy. A character that must set out an important test. A character has to choose between love and their career. It's kind of a boring thing because you always predict about what kind of things can happen there. And there are some narrow plots there. So that's why. I recommend that uh, don't take these kind of choices between love and something maybe else than career. But of course, when they started these kind of cyclic stories, yeah, it was great. But maybe not anymore. If don't have, you have a, a fresh uh, idea about that. Also, that the hero experiences a life-changing tragedy so that we can always understand yeah that's the tragedy and this will happen in way of or something else that uh, we probably have known so many times okay as i promised i take the silence of the lambs which was uh, in a movie 91 and it came as a novel first from Thomas Harris and Ted Daly made a screenplay about it and Jonathan Dim made it a direction there. And they were starring this duo, Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins. And uh, they are very interesting characters. Of course, it's a very old story and it's a very old movie. But I think that it's kind of a, uh, not so easily to go to the cliches. Of course, it's ripped off and the serial killer stories came to the uh, mainstream movies. They were B movies before that. So in the Science of the Lambs, as in novel and uh, in the movie series and uh, novel series, uh, that is duo. It's kind of a fairy tale story for the adult. There's Dr. Hannibal Lecter, which have very colorful and interesting background story, but his history is opening in his books and uh, also in the movies in a very uh, not so easily way because he's hiding it in his own memory cathedral. But Dr. Hannibal Lecter is brilliant, he's cunning, and he's very psychotic. In his mind lies the clue to a ruthless killer, and he's a killer. And then there is young Clarice Starling, 
FBI student and then working in the FBI. She's brilliant, she's vulnerable, and she's very much alone. And in this story, she must trust Dr. Hannibal Lecter to stop the real killer in the present. So it's a kind of very interesting relationship. And uh, you can avoid in this kind of relationship uh, all kind of cliches. Of course, you can fall them too, but you can also uh, see all kind of opportunities. So here's a hero's journey, which is a, a medical structure, which are used uh, 100 years, thousands of years in all kinds of stories. So there's first an ordinary world and it's FBI Academy. Yeah, and uh, here Clarice is, is so aspires to work for Jack Crawford, which is the head of the FBI's Behavior Science Division after her graduation. And uh, working in this place with Jack Crawford is also her outer problem, because Jack Crawford is her mentor. And uh, in Clarice's background, she have a very bad tragedy. She worshipped her father, the town marshal, and felt abandoned when he was murdered. Something fundamentally bad thing happened for her mind. So Clarice's inner problems is to come to terms with his death. And in this story, we can only deal with the death. So it's kind of very interesting backstory for a FBI investigator. And of course, she's young. And uh, to have this adventure, this journey, Gladys have to convince convicted serial killer Hannibal Lecter fill out questionnaire to help this uh, serial killer called Buffalo Bill. And it's not an easy task. She have called to the adventure, which is to convince Hannibal Lecter. She refused the call, which is one state of the hero's journey. And Clarice is warning from Crawford, his uh, under her uh, mentor. Crawford says to the Clarice, don't want Hannibal Lecter in your head. And this is the thing that of course happens. And that will change Clarice's mind and Clarice's way of dealing her father's death and also what she really wants to be as an investigator in the FBI. So mentor Crawford encourages, but also warns her. Lecter is also, and that's a new one, there are two mentors. Lecter is a shadow mentor, we can say. And uh, the next step is uh, cross the threshold, in this case, to solve Buffalo Bill's murders. So there have to be many tests for the hero, and that will happen for the uh, Clarice, of course, she discovers a car, a headless mannequin, plus man's head in a jar. It's quite brutal. More tests will come. Autopsy finds insects pupa in victim's mouth. And there will also all kind of clues that will lead to the 
deeper in the in, in the search and the story of the uh, circular buffer bill. And uh, Clarice are facing all kinds of states, stakes that are raised. And uh, Crawford and Clarice need to make a deal with Lecter, which is uh, very dangerous. And they will promise a room with a view for Lecter, who is in prison, for a profile uh, of Buffalo Bill. And Lecter accepts on condition that Clarice answers his questions, as uh, Hannibal Lecter says, good for crew. So she must allow Lecter to get into her mind, which is dangerous. But she accepts and tells of her father's death. So there will be a kind of very interesting relationship between Clarice and Lecter. So Lecter can be a shadow mentor, therapist, and also the beast one. And she's very interesting about the Clarice's person. And the Clarice is a very interesting about Lecter's person, which is dangerous. And uh, they will have all kind of turns in their relationships. Lecter finally gives some information, but demands one more ordeal. Forces Clarice to tell about her nightmare of the spring lamps. And she will try to save Catherine, which is hostile in Buffalo Bill, so that if Clarice can save Catherine and catch the serial killer Buffalo Bill, the problem that uh, Clarice have is uh, nightmares where there's always uh, the lamps screaming, but uh, the lector gives some information how uh, Clarice could be uh, in this situation that the silence and screaming is uh, changing so that uh, there will be a silence uh, in uh, Clarice's dreams. So there is this deal. And uh, There will be this journey with uh, trying to catch Buffalo Bill, and there are all kinds of interrupts and all kinds of uh, disturbing things happening there. And uh, Gladys will succeed there. FBI looks in the wrong spot, but Gladys, in her own studies are actually finding Buffalo Bill into his house. Uh, she discovers Catherine, finds a skinning room where Buffalo Bill is doing uh, his skins, and uh, lights go out, that's kind of cliche, but surrounded by darkness and death, Clarice is unaware that uh, Buffalo Bill man called Gump, pursues her with uh, infrared goggles. Now it's also very cliche, but in this time this was newer. He taunts her, points a gun at her. Clarice hears the metallic click of gun, turns and shoots and complete shooting uh, Buffalo Bill. And in this mythical structure, you always return as a hero with elixir. And elixir can be so that the, the case, is, uh, case is closed in a thriller, which is a psychological thriller, this Sound of Lamps. So case is sold. Buffalo Bill is dead. Catherine is rescued. Clarice is finally graduates. Clarice earns 
Crawford's respect. And as a mentor, Crawford tells Clarice her father will be proud. Then there is a phone call from another proud mentor, and this one is Lecter. And Lecter tells Clarice she is safe, and now the screaming lambs will be in silence. And uh, so the uh, hero's personality have found a new way of looking things because she has saved herself with help with the mentors. And the way how Clarice is acting, doing things, choosing things, making good turns and bad turns, they are facets of personality. And uh, then we can find that uh, she's kind of round person with uh, all kind of interesting things in her character. And uh, I think that it's always a good thing when you are watching a movie that uh, you list things. I mean that when you watch something, not just uh, please for yourself, but just uh, analyze them, is making lists. And uh, this will be your exercise also. So I will give you some lists. And uh, they are characters basics. I mean, if you think Silence of the Lambs, characters have, of course, names. So why Clarice? Why Catherine? Why Hannibal the Cannibal? Lecter, his nickname is Hannibal the Cannibal. But there's always a story why parents give and choose one name for a forename. And of course, so name will come there. What is AIDS? It would be a very different story if uh, uh, Clarice was in the same AIDS group as uh, Dr. Lecter is. What kind of build she is? Is he skinny? Is he fat? Is he rounded? Is it tall? What kind of weight or height? There could be a background of them. Because uh, the way how people look, they can be changing in their lives. In many times, or also they can be in the same field as they will give it for adult watching and when they are older. Third place, Lecter is from Estonia. That's a one secret. What kind of color hair? Is there a reason why she is coloring his or her hair? Eyes. They are very physical things, but uh, they also can be having some kind of clues for the background. That's why I recommend that when you are making a character, you have these kind of things, name, age, height, weight, third place, color hair, eyes, color hair, et cetera, et cetera. Then physical peculiarities. Is there some kind of interesting that uh, the character is uh, having as a Dr. Lecter uh, in his right hand, I guess, there are six fingers, not five. That's a physical figure it is. Educational background, Dr. Lecter is a doctor. 
and uh, he's also a therapist psychology. As their best friend, are there enemies in character's life? I mean that maybe he or she doesn't understand it that I have an enemy or enemies. Or maybe the character doesn't understand that uh, she or he really have best friend. What kind of family is in the present day? What kind of family there was in the background history? What is the core need of this character? And this is something very deep inside uh, of personal identity. What is the core need? of this one character. And you have to remember that the, the character doesn't understand his core need. Clarice doesn't understand that uh, the problem is these screaming lamps and they have been in silence. But this is the one thing that defines uh, Dr. Lecter as an uh, mentor for the Clarice, that this is your problem. The thing that happened to your father and the reaction after that, what happened to the lamps? What drives him or her? Maybe the thing that uh, she or he doesn't understand, doesn't know it. But we can see it in action. It's not interesting that the person says, that's the thing that drives me. It can be a lie, then it's more interesting. Or it can be a false thing to say. But don't say the correct thing. As an audience, we have to understand that uh, this is Harry Potter's uh, driving thing. What kind of ambition in life? And uh, does he or she understand his or her ambitions? Maybe not. So is there a mentor or somebody else who will understand characters' ambitions? What makes your character laugh? Maybe he or she is not laughing at the story at all. So there is a reason. But when she is willing or able to laugh, what makes him or her laugh? That's kind of interesting. It's kind of sad when character understands that the I haven't been laughing in a long time, or maybe crying. So what kind of thing makes him or her cry? And not just a general and average way, but uh, uh, in a kind of uh, very personal way, intimate things. Is she or he, when he or she is making love, a kind of a crying person? Will the spectators like or dislike the character? Don't be afraid that uh, your persons are liking or disliking characters. He or she will be anyway interesting. I mean that uh, I really don't like Dr. Lecter. There are things that are very interesting for me, but I don't like it. I mean that uh, he's so manipulative and not just that as uh, he's a serial killer, but uh, in a way how he's using his uh, inner powers 
he really is manipulate person. Oh, Karita told something I have to say. So just one moment, I have to answer her. Joo, se kysyy, että voiko se jakaa näin, vaikka mut sanoo, että saa joku. Joo. Kaitaa sharing. These seats for you. So. There are characters checklists for the background, parents' profile, socioeconomic level, habits, brothers or sisters, family structure, and you can see it in the making characters seat. These basics, gender, physical abilities, limitations. It's always good that uh, the person doesn't maybe understand uh, his uh, or her uh, abilities and limitations, but they will find out in the story when uh, he or she is growing. Locations are very interesting. I mean that uh, you can always change locations and uh, things that uh, maybe this is not uh, interesting in a realistic world. Maybe it's interesting more in a fantasy world or vice versa. This person personality traits or tendencies, introvert or extrovert. Is he or she more thinking or feeling person? So one thing that uh, I always trying to understand, of course, of course we are just thinking and feeling, but is he or she or what kind of character is depending Maybe he's a unicorn, and uh, unicorn is uh, not a horse, it's a fantasy creature. Is this one uh, unicorn that you are thinking and creating and exploring? Uh, is he or she more thinking or feeling? And as a unicorns, are they mostly feeling persons, characters, creatures, or thinking? That would be interesting. Uh, one good thing is personal goals. And uh, also, you need personal details clothes and is he or she understanding in herself victim or savior innocent or ironic feature feature is your character mostly self-centered selfish or selfless education can be a cool thing sometimes uh, Characters are lying about their education or they're hiding their educations. Hobbies are very interesting. Fears. This kind of uh, most hated things. I mean, I make quite many of list of characters when I'm creating them. And I make this most hated list for all the characters that I can understand what they mostly hate. and what they mostly want, what they mostly love. And of course, the deepest secret, maybe something that uh, he or she doesn't understand or have uh, courage to say it loud, maybe hidden it. 
but it can be something that they really understand that this is my deepest secret. For example, one close people of my life exposed that uh, her deepest secret, secret is that uh, when she was child, she tried to kill her brother and she almost succeeded. And uh, when she said that, I could understand why she was so close to her brother. And also why her brother was acting in this kind of uh, peculiar way. She was kind of, uh, he was kind of a, a little bit afraid maybe, but he also was very keen of her uh, big sister. And there was kind of interesting connection. And uh, she said that uh, this is my greatest secret and nobody else, and I guess maybe she wasn't lying, and nobody else know about it. And then she was kind of waiting of, not a punishment, but uh, some kind of uh, saying about this. And I was just in silence because there's not, nothing to say. There was so much to think, to feel and think. But this was a kind of a interesting thing to have there. I really tried to kill my brother. Are they closest friends? If they are lost, why? Attitude towards family or friendship or love or whatever. And as I said before, what makes your character laugh or cry? And when was the last time he or she was openly laughing or openly crying? That's kind of interesting things. So your exercise will be that you make list of one of your character. I don't know if you have any project here now. This can, can be a very new one. It can be something that you have developed before, whatever. But I hope that uh, you will make a list about characters' basics and uh, kind of a checklist about the background and basics and personality traits, this introvert and extrovert things, intuition or sensation things, brothers, sisters, family structures, religion maybe, socioeconomic class, locations, and uh, Carita will uh, share with you, but I have to do something that uh, she said that you can have it. Okay, I can't watch documents before you open something. Okay, yeah, well, I will open this if I can. And uh, you will have 15 minutes to make some kind of lists about your character. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean that, uh, what kind of template. Ah, oh, no, just uh, so that you can have a material for yourself that you can understand, okay, this kind of person, I think this my character is right now and these kind of things I know right now about uh, him or her. And uh, this is kind of things that uh, it's just uh, for yourself, not sharing for each other, just uh, intimate thing that you can be very, open-minded uh, what you are uh, going to do with it. Uh, I would take some uh, 
give some questions after that if you have uh, made it. But no, in this kind of uh, question, only what is my character and uh, how I can understand right now uh, my character. Okay, any more questions? Okay, thanks. All right, 15 minutes. Good luck.